Hello and welcome to a new podcast from the British Film Institute, cunningly titled for now the BFI Podcast. I'm Henry Barnes and here every other week is where I'll be hauling a resident expert in to talk us through their cinematic passion. We'll showcase clips and interviews as well as loads of archive material from the BFI vaults. This week... Please welcome Martin Scorsese. Yes, we're starting our pod with part one of a two-part tribute to the bushy-browed avuncular auteur of American indie, Martin Scorsese. Thank you very much. I'll be joined by Jeff Andrew, Programmer-in-Chief at the BFI South Bank and the curator of our current Scorsese season, to talk about the director's life and work. We've dug up vintage Marty moments from his visits to the BFI South Bank, and we have archive clips of some of his closest collaborators, including Thelma Schoonmacher, Paul Schrader and Robert De Niro, talking about working with him. A quick note here, Scorsese is pronounced Scorsese, or so says he. Hello, Vince. Hey, it's Marty Scorsese. See? Us Brits tend to get from A to B by way of Sazy. You'll find multiple slip-ups of the same from here on in, I'm afraid. Sorry. Anyway, in 1987, Martin Scorsese appeared on stage at what was then the National Film Theatre as part of the Scorsese album, a retrospective curated by the journalist David Thompson. To avoid any the usual confusion, I should point out I did not write the biographical dictionary of the cinema. But uh, despite this great omission in my life, um, it has been my pleasure to put together this season called the Scorsese album. And tonight, it's my even greater pleasure to introduce you to Martin Scorsese himself. Scorsese picked three films to screen as part of the programme. Citizen Kane, Eight and a Half, and Rocco and His Brothers. Citizen Kane is Orson Welles' 1941 mystery about a newspaper tycoon and his inky conscience. Critics regularly vote it the greatest film of all time. Is that really your idea of how to run a newspaper? I don't know how to run a newspaper, Mr. Thatcher. I just try everything I can think of. I think for me it was very important because when I first saw it, there was a program on New York television called Million Dollar Movie, which uh, originally showed I had seen Powell Pressburger films there, Red Shoes and Tales of Hoffman particularly. And it showed uh, twice an evening, at 7.30 and 9.30, and for seven days a week. And I would, if I really liked something, I would sort of watch it over and over. And Citizen Kane, I first saw on that, on that uh, uh, program, mm-hmm. um, cut. The March of Time sequence was out. Oh. But I didn't know that. I, I was still mesmerized by the picture. And I was about 14 or 15 years old, and I think I became aware for the first time of what a director uh, did. And then I, I discovered that it was playing at the Thalia Theater in New York on 96th Street, along with John Ford's The Informer, and I went up to see it there. And that, the screen at the Thalia Theater is about what today is now considered a, a, the, the Cineplex theaters in America that look like little closets. They're like little, little screens like this. And that, the Thalia had that screen, but it didn't matter. That's when I saw the complete film, and I was overwhelmed again. And I'm going to forget, it was a rainy night, and there was a mob trying to get in, people, and The Informer. And, and uh, there, thereafter, both films played. Uh, the Informer and uh, Citizen Kane played uh, all over New York, and I, I dragged my friends and my parents and everybody to mm-hmm. see it. Mm-hmm. And I just studied it. I was just overwhelmed by it. Eight and a Half, Scorsese's second choice, is Federico Fellini's comedy drama about a creatively stifled director attempting to make a big-budget sci-fi. È bellissima. Giovane antica. Bambina e già donna. Autentica, solare. Non c'è dubbio che sia lei la sua salvezza. With eight and a half, I saw it about two weeks before I started to f- shoot my first short film at New York University. What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? And the impact was over- overwhelming because of the fluidity of the film um, and the beauty of the black and white. I never seen anything. I never seen black and white like that um, over the years. Of course, the American black and white, the old nitrate prints, that's something else. But this black and white was was mm-hmm. astounding, mm-hmm. and it was even uh, it was it was shown at the Festival Theater in New York on 57th Street. And uh, uh, despite the fact the festival theater always had the center of the screen out of focus, <laughs> you, you, couldn't, you, you don't want the whole thing focused. You'd want the, the, you want the right side, the left side, or the center, you know. And Rocco and his brothers is Luciano Visconti's family drama about five Italian brothers thrown to the wind after a move to Milan. It was part of a body of European cinema that had a profound impact on American directors like Scorsese. <laughs> Non mi credi, ma non capisci che allora è tutto inutile, non vale la pena, non credo più a niente. What the new wave films gave us uh, as film students were, in New York was a sense of, um, of freedom, a sense of uh, being able to do anything. You didn't necessarily have to shoot a film in the traditional manner, which was naturally your, your master shot, medium, and close up. And if a person gets up, you should really track with them, or you should pan with them. Sometimes you just jump them out of a chair. You know, or I'm breathless, uh, or in, in my life to live, Viva Savi, you know, mm. he's reading a letter and suddenly 
cuts and is tearing up the letter. You know, she gets up and gets up to take the letter out of her hand. It's a jump cut. Mm-hmm. But it's all done. In, uh, it was just a sense of total freedom of breaking, breaking the uh, the natural narrative, the d- dramatic narrative that we had been that we had been raised on in a sense, watching films from, from Hollywood in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Scorsese has always been as much film fan as filmmaker. His love of cinema started when he was a kid. He grew up severely asthmatic in New York's Little Italy, and unable to run around the streets like the others, he found his adventure in the cinema. His skill has been in resisting the urge to show off, instead channeling his cinephilia into the service of his own stories, says Jeff Andrew. He can't help himself quoting from films because he's got so many memories in his head all the time. But he doesn't sort of ram his cinephilia home. Scorsese uses those borrowings because they're useful to him in terms of expression rather than just to show that he's seen a load of movies. And his films work on in their own right anyway. The borrowings are a subsidiary to the main film, I think. You know, they don't feel as if they've intruded on the storytelling. Scorsese loved and loves the craft of film as much as the art. He's been described as a picky filmmaker, someone who can obsess over the details, but he's a pragmatic one too. Here he is talking about the mildly unsavoury concessions he had to make to get his debut feature, Who's That Knocking at My Door, seen. It was finished in 1967. We showed it at the Chicago Film Festival, and Roger Ebert gave it this great review, Mm. and it was under the title I Call First, which was one of those wonderful titles. Nobody knew what the hell to call this picture. (laughs) And... uh, then we still couldn't get it released. Got great reviews, could st- still could not get it released until I was in, I was in uh, Europe in 68. I was in Paris and then wound up, um, they said that the only way to get it done is a guy named Joseph Brenner and Associates. Joseph Brenner and Associates uh, who really uh, distributes um, softcore porno. In 1968 in America, everything was opening up. There were like, you know, nude films being shown and, and to really get a film distributed and be shown in America at that time, you had to have at least one nude scene. So they said, if you make one nude scene, and put it in the middle of the film. This guy, Joe Brenner, is going to go legitimate. He's going to, this is going to be his first legitimate film. He had, he had my film and Birth of a Nation. This <laughs> film. And he was, literally, he was literally situated on 42nd Street. Uh, I can't. If you haven't been there, you don't know. It's just it's such a the most vile area. Right, right off 8th Avenue. Right here. That was his office. And Joe, Joe he's still there. His son is, his son is there. Mm. And um, uh, what we did, I shot the mid scene. I shot it in Amsterdam because I couldn't get out of Paris. There was all that fighting. I went, up, I went up in Amsterdam, and uh, uh, Harvey Keitel flew over, and we got the girls in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, and we shot it in what looks like a loft on, on the Bowery. It looks like mm-hmm. a loft on 3rd Avenue in, in New York, and actually it was, uh, it was in, uh, in Amsterdam. It was a lot of fun, and we put the doors on it, the music at the end, mm-hmm. the, um, the Freudian part, <laughs> <laughs> to really hammer it home. You know? His second film, Boxcar Bertha, was made for Roger Corman's American International Pictures, an exploitation chop shop that followed the dictum of its founding mogul, Samuel Z. Arkoff. His eponymous formula for a winning movie zeroed in on an audience of 19-year-old males, and the Arkoff formula dictated that a film should contain action, revolution, killing, oratory, fantasy, and fornication. At the time, Scorsese was scraping by, albeit with the patronage of one of the founders of American indie cinema. I did some part-time work for John Cassavetes on Minnie Moskowitz as a sound editor. Basically, I didn't do anything. John just supported me and also uh, kept me alive. On, on I, I lived on his live set for, for about a week because I moved out of apartments. and I, It was all kinds of craziness. And I, he actually helped me out and I lived on his live set and then uh, gave me $500 a week for doing sound cutting, which I didn't do. <laughs> one, once I did do, he had to, there's a fight scene in Minnie Moskowitz and he had to do the sound effects himself. So I held him while he punched himself. <laughs> Scorsese only made the one film for AIP. He left after Cassavetes told him he'd spent a year making, quote, a piece of shit. Yet a lot of his films fit the Arkoff formula. He is, in many ways, still an exploitation guy. The Wolf of Wall Street, Scorsese's hyperactive take on the 2009 financial crisis, is a case in point. It was made more than 40 years after Boxcar Bertha, but ticks nearly all the A-R-K-O-F-F boxes. It's sexy, fantastic, action-packed, dialogue-heavy, and controversial. Nobody gets killed, but given the colossal drug consumption on screen, it's a minor miracle. But Scorsese sidestepped a career as a genre filmmaker by heading home. 
Through Mean Streets, his 1973 drama about a little Italy hood struggling to align his nefarious lifestyle with his Catholic faith, Scorsese showed the world the neighborhood he knew. The film starred Harvey Keitel as Charlie Kappa, a mob enforcer doing his best to keep a wayward friend from pushing the mob's buttons. That character, John Johnny Boy Civello, was played by an actor who would become one of Scorsese's most regular and rewarding collaborators. Marty and I met at a friend's house, I guess, about 12, 13 years ago. Um, we had seen each other when we were kids in the street, but that's something else. But we sort of knew each other a little bit, but we met again like as adults. Officially, I, I guess it's about 13, 14 years ago. That's Robert De Niro talking at the BFI South Bank to Chris Orty, then a journalist, now a producer, who worked on Crash, Bright Young Things and The Proposition. A quick side note, this was recorded in 1985. De Niro's public persona post Mean Streets and Taxi Driver had hardened. He is, throughout this interview, a frosty old grump. It makes for quite awkward listening, but have a listen. Your work with him on, on Mean Streets was the beginning of a, a long collaboration. Right. And it was also a watershed well, in both your careers, really. I mean, it was yeah. it made you both, and it made Harvey Keitel's right. name as well. What, what was it about the picture, do you think, that gave it more than that New York... Uh, rather limited feeling. What was it about the film that uh, carried it outside the New York ambience? Which film? Mean Streets. I don't know. I mean, it's very much a New York film. That's that's something for you maybe to to say. I don't. I, you know, being not only not an American but um, from England, that's. Um, I, I don't know. I, I really don't. What What was the research element of? of that you're asking me what, play, what would the that. appeal be to people outside of that? I'm curious world. about it because you grew up inside it. You grew up, in, to some extent, in that mm -hmm. Italian New York world, and I just wonder how that how that world is understandable to people, not just out, outside of America, but even outside just outside New York. How it would be understandable to people in the Midwest? Would it be a comprehensible movie to people outside New York? I don't know. I think basically, I mean the. The things are quite simple, well, no matter if it's that, those people or whatever. Or whatever. I mean, uh, but I don't think it was a big success around uh, the world, uh, as far as uh, you know, Box office. people in the Midwest or even in the West. You know, I don't feel it wasn't the movie to see in, in, the, in the small towns in Iowa. Since then, I've never wanted to interview Robert De Niro myself, um, much as I admire him as an actor. This is Jeff Andrew. He is notoriously taciturn when interviewed, but in my experience, quite a lot of actors are pretty shy people. I think that's one reason why they act, because they can become somebody else and stop being shy. It's not a pleasant experience. If you're very shy, why not act? It's a good way to get rid of it. It's interesting that Scorsese seems to be a similar personality who's gone to the other extreme, though, and that he's something of a motor mouth. Yes, well, if you've seen uh, Italian American, the documentary made about his parents, you can see where he got it from. His his mother is extremely was was extremely garrulous, and of course, he used to like having little cameos by her in his films very often. She's the one who plays, well, we just hear her in King of Comedy, continually moaning to Rupert Pupkin about him staying up in his room. And Scorsese, I've only interviewed him once, I've met him a few times, and I had an hour long interview and it took ages to transcribe because he spoke so much. Bob had heard that I had made a film about the neighborhood called Who's That Knocking? And uh, he, had, he used to hang out in the neighborhood in a different group of um, different group of people. Let me put it this way, there's like eight square blocks, and every block has its own group of um, guys who hang out, so to speak, and they're all related to each other. And uh, Sometimes they mix, sometimes they don't, and that sort of thing. But he, he used to be with people who were from Kenbury Street or, Bring, or, or Broom Street, and we were on Prince Street, so it was a little different. And we'd see each other and at dances and at certain places, say hello, and mm. that sort of thing. So I remembered him. And he remembered me, actually, first at the dinner. He said, you used to be with so-and-so. And he mentioned about five or six guys that I, I would hang out with. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, how did you know that? He said, I'm so, oh, I didn't really recognize you. And it went on like that. And uh, he heard about the film. When he saw Who's That Knocking, he liked it because it, it was the only accurate portrait we had had at that time of an Italian-American living in Lower East Side. It was that, that was it. Scorsese and De Niro's breakout collaboration was Taxi Driver. Written by Paul Schrader and released in 1976, it made an icon of its central character, Travis Bickle. Travis is the brooding nihilist who shuttles the denizens of New York's underworld around 
while fantasizing about wiping them out for good. He's alienated, damaged and dangerous and later became an icon for a certain sect of real-world alienated youth. The character inspired John Hinckley Jr. who attempted to assassinate Ronald Reagan in 1981. He carried out his attack in order to impress De Niro's co-star, Jodie Foster, who he was fixated on. There's always going to be a little leakage in the system. It's never going to be perfect. And occasionally, someone's going to read Crime and Punishment and go kill an old woman. That's Paul Schrader speaking to journalist Derek Malcolm at the BFI South Bank in 1993. Even if you take that argument that great art doesn't cause, mm. it can't, is not detrimental, there's going to be leakage mm. in that argument too. Sure. <laughs> you know, because psychopaths get triggered by everything, including great art. Kids who see Superman, they, they put a towel on the neck and they jump off the roof. What are you going to do? And that's De Niro talking about Hinckley's attack. I think more interesting is its portrait of people who are very alienated, who feel the world has let them down some way. Jeff Andrew. They're very lonely. They don't know how to express themselves. They don't know how to get on with people. And and they need some way to externalise all their their bad feelings about the world. And sadly, sometimes that comes out in violence, as we've seen far too many times, and far more frequently now than used to be the case. So, yeah, it's very prescient. And it's always a scary film. I think these days it feels even more scary. After Taxi Driver, Scorsese was lauded by the press as the bad boy of American indie. Blood and guts turn me on, screamed the headline of a Village Voice interview, published around the time of the film's release. Later, when Scorsese turned from the grit and dismay of Taxi Driver to his next film, the 1940s set musical called New York, New York, the New York Times asked if Dracula had suddenly become Snow White. Both tax missed the point, says Jeff Andrew. Scorsese was and is always about balancing light and shade. I'm surprised that they wrote that because that film, which I deeply love, and yes, it's a sort of musical, but it has some of the most convincing and ugly marital arguments that I've ever seen on the screen. They really go for it, De Niro and Minnelli in that film, and you do sometimes wonder whether Minnelli wondered what she'd let herself in for. I think it's a great movie. It's a wonderful film about... A relationship which is more or less doomed to founder, but you can still see why the people sort of are attracted to one another and why they go ahead with it against all the odds. But it's also a great film about the history of American cinema, the history of American musicals, and indeed a certain history of American music, uh, particularly popular music and jazz, of course. And Scorsese has always paid a great deal of attention to music from the very early days and indeed still makes documentaries about musicians. You feel that he really knows what he's talking about in that film when he's dealing with the music, when he's dealing with the movies and indeed when he's dealing with relationships going badly. A one, two, three, four. And on the breezy tones of Robert De Niro pootling away on a saxophone, we'll leave it there for this week. Join me in a fortnight for part two of our Scorsese special, when we'll look at Scorsese's religious leanings, hear from the woman who made his finest film sing, and go toe-to-toe with a certain slugger called Mr. Jake LaMotta. The BFI Scorsese season continues to run at the BFI South Bank in London until the end of this month. Check www.bfi.org.uk for details. You can follow me on Twitter at Henry H. Barnes and Jeff Andrew at Jeff underscore Andrew. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in two weeks.